Sage Wanderer here, and welcome to Story Time with Uncle Sage. So this is like my seventh or eighth attempt at making this video. I'm a little frustrated. My, now my tripod is rebelling. Stop it. Cease and desist. I know when I get this much resistance that the video is going to be good. This isn't even about anything spectacular, but I realize on my multiple attempts now to make this video as I congeal this story and get it into a tellable form, that at the root of this story is a testimony of how God takes care of me. If uh, you're one of those people that love me so much that you wanted to support me financially uh, in this endeavor and have suggested that I get a Patreon or that, you know, I have an email account or something that you can somehow send money to or you just want to help. And I so appreciate that. And to me, that's just a, a vote of confidence. And it tells me that you that you like what I'm doing here. And uh, that's important to me. But I always reject the offer. And I reply by saying one thing. No, thank you, because God takes care of me. I, I don't beg for money on my channel because God takes care of me. And I realize when trying to tell this story of how I became a TV cameraman, I realize how God takes care of me. So, a little context here. Many of you have heard my true crossroads story of how I left the music business. But you may not know what happened next because I had a family to take care of. Now, I didn't have children when I first left, but immediately leaving the music business, realizing that I was going to be home more, I made the decision to start my family. And so pretty quickly, I had two kids to take care of. And when I first came out of the music business, man, there was just, I didn't have a plan B. Always have a plan B? I promise you, you, you may need it, and you should always have a plan B. But I did not, I thought that would be a sign that I was undetermined to succeed as a musician. So I engaged in, in, in going all in in the music business. So when it didn't work out for me, see my video, um, then I didn't have a plan B. Now, because leaving that also coincided with a spiritual change in me, see my video how the Waco incident led me to Christ and um, you'll know that right then I made the decision to go back to my roots and be a Christian again and to be in Christian ministry and to get the call to the ministry but here's the thing the truth about that is that it takes you know it takes a whole lot of to be a musician it takes a whole lot of talent a whole lot of talent professionalism but if you have talent and professionalism, you can go out there and almost immediately, immediately start making some money. But you have to prove yourself for years before you are trusted enough to preach, enough to earn any money whatsoever, and that you have to work for free for a very long time before you ever get paid anything as a preacher. And I knew that. So I had to have some way of making money. So there was an interesting thing happening in technology that I was aware of. That was uh, history now is referred to as the studio, the project studio revolution, or the digital revolution in recording. So the digital revolution is when recording equipment got so cheap that it allowed the average everyday Joe to record songs in their own home or in their garage. When this happened, a few people like me who were entrepreneurs decided, hey, I can open a recording studio charge a third of what the big analog studios are charging in town, pick up all of the small band demos and independent record artists who want to make records locally, and, uh, and steal that you know, business away from those big companies by underselling them and still produce as good, if not a better product, because I'm a musician and I know what I'm doing. And so I did. I educated myself quickly on the digital technology. I purchased some. I played with it. And then luckily, I owned my own home outright. And adjacent to my home was what's known as a mother-in-law house, where I had um, a 750-square-foot, two-bedroom home with a kitchen and bathroom that was just begging to be made into a recording studio. So with 10,000 of my own dollars and a 10,000 uh, more dollars that were borrowed, 
uh, not from corporations, but from people who believed in me, I opened my own project studio. Now the problem is, hmm, I wasn't the only guy right then who had that idea. And there were so many of us that we had to undersell each other to just get the a small amount of business that we were stripping away from the main studios. So there was this big feeding frenzy with too many fish and not enough food. And so, I mean, I remember selling studio time for as little as $15 an hour when I had just recorded a record in a Dallas studio uh, probably two years before this moment where I was paying them uh, $85 an hour to record in the middle of the night because I couldn't afford the $180 to $250 day rate that they were charging people like Stevie Ray Vaughan to record there. So here I was selling studio time for as little as $15 and I was really struggling. And I had a buddy who worked for a major corporation. He was on the payroll there. This, um, this buddy had played with me in a, in a Christian rock band and we knew each other really well. And he was involved with me as I got my studio going. And he calls me one day about a year into my studio project or two years. Um, about a year, uh, about a year in, he calls me on the phone one morning right before Christmas and he's like, Hey, I need you to come down here and, uh, run camera for me. Now I knew that he made, uh, that he worked for this corporation making videos that he was a television producer for their in-house production company. And they made training videos. Uh, they recorded their shareholder meetings. They recorded uh, live town hall meetings that were broadcast on closed circuit television. And uh, I didn't know anything about that business at all. I just knew he worked there. And he's like, look, I need you to come run camera. And I'm like, I'm not a cameraman. I wouldn't know which end to look into. And he said, look, TV production and music production, eh, it's the same thing. Just a little different. The technology is really similar. You're gonna you're gonna recognize a lot of this, and you'll take right to it. And I've seen you do uh, you know graphic and graphic art for albums and stuff. I know you have an eye for photography. I think I can use you. And these guys, these these art school grads, man, they make a they you know they make an appointment to come and work for me, and then they flake. And I'm just tired of it. And I need contractors that will come and work. And he said, look, you know, I think I know you're pretty good, but you don't have a criminal record, do you? And I'm like, no. And he goes, so, because to get paid, you got to become a defense contractor for the military because, you know, this corporation does military work and that's a requirement of their contract with the military is that any contractor that works for them, subcontractor, has to have, uh, has to have a background check and be registered as a defense contractor. So I said, there should be no problem there. So he says, well, show up in the morning. So I show up there. I don't know the difference between a close-up, a wide shot. I don't know what panning or zooming is. I have no idea what not to do. <laughs> but I seem to just luck into taking, you know, taking to it like a duck to water. And also I have my friend who's the producer, and I have a headset on, you know, with a mic. And I'm, and I'm running this camera that was a $150,000 digital camera system on what's called an Osprey base. And it's, it's pneumatic, so it's controlled by the air. And, and I got the zoom, and I got the, and I got the focus over here. And I can do all kinds of stuff with this. I can zoom, I can pan, I can, you know, I can go up and down, I can go in and out, I can roll it, I can move it. It's really cool. And I got to operate that. I'm like, man, this is like a little kid, you know. But I'm scared to death because I know that they're. I'm one of four cameramen, and the other three guys they went to college for this, and then they worked for free for a long time as interns before they actually got paid to do what they're doing. And the pay is ridiculous. It's get this. Even by today's standards, it's still ridiculous. Three hundred. I started at 325 a day. By the end of my time with this corporation as a contractor, I was making $375 a day. $275 for a half a day. A half a day was just anything where I showed up. I could only maybe I was only there for an hour and a half and I would make $275. If I was there for any time over 4 hours, I got $375 an hour and sometimes I was able to book a morning gig for a half day pay at 275 an afternoon gig for a half pay half day pay at 275 and then an evening 
gig for half day pay at 275 except it's after hours now so I get to charge them double that I could make as much as a thousand dollars or more in a single day and I did on that job but on my first day I was freaking out but luckily my friend and I were stage mates you know, we were musicians that had played together before, and there's almost a telepathy. I'll do a coffee talk on that, or maybe just a video on the telepathy that happens between musicians. But thankfully, because of that, I was able to provide him with the shots that he wanted without letting any of the other cameramen know that I was. He told me right up front, don't let them know you didn't go to college. You got to fake it till you make it. Because if they know you didn't go to film school and you're here, they're going to, well, they'll run you out of business. They'll chase, they'll, they'll all they'll all say they'll quit if they if you come back so you cannot let them know this but I bluffed my way into that job I liked it after that uh, there was two days I worked for them in a row after that I purchased a VHS videotape series on how to film and how to shoot videos it taught me things like the rule of thirds it taught me things like you know the difference in the shots what's a wide shot what's a close-up what's a head and shoulders what's an extreme close-up um, yeah, transitions, um, how to work in a multi-camera live setting. And I made a lot of money. And while I was working there for about three years, I, um, I actually um, met some really famous people, prime ministers of countries, global executives. I was, I was able to sit in on super secret technology that is now a part of daily life but was high, uh, you know, uh, high technology secret stuff, you know, and this was probably 18 years ago when I was doing this. That a lot of the stuff that, uh, you know, that now we are hearing about and we're like, wow, 20 years ago they had it. They just didn't know how to develop it. They just hadn't ready, they didn't have it ready to market yet. And uh, I was in on some secret stuff. There was some, they swore me to secrecy on a lot of that stuff. I can't even talk about it still without, because uh, it was a, you know, a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, I can talk about some things, uh, public things. I will say this, you know, the little Chevy pickup that, uh, that looks like an old 50s pickup that was like a little sport car pickup they had for a while. I can't remember the model of it. But man, those were really cool when they first came out. And the first time I ever saw one of those, it was a 3D computerized mock-up where it zipped around a track and it just looked as real as could be because it was computer-generated graphics from General Motors. And then they, they broke it apart and you could see all the little parts in it inside and they put it back together. It was a cool video. But that was a great job. Eventually, I quit working there because they found out. They found out because they liked me so much working there, and eventually I became the lead camera guy, and my I got a pay increase, and I was corralling all the... I was essentially a manager over these other contractors, and they wanted to put me on the payroll, and I put them off and put them off. They wanted to hire me full-time, and I put them off and put them off because I didn't want to fill out the application and let them know that I'd never been to film school, that really I didn't even have a college degree at that time, nothing. And um, I was a musician, you know, that's it. And finally, they, um, you know, they forced me into the corner and I filled out the deal, deal and I gave them this resume, which really just consisted of all the bands I'd played in. And um, yeah, they let me go. They didn't hire me and they quit using me as a contractor. I never lied, I just didn't tell them <laughs> <laughs> my history and you know honestly until then they never asked but that's the story of how for about three years of my life I was a highly paid television cameraman all right till next time